Matty. I'd like to first of all acknowledge the traditional owners and elders past, present and emerging. What I'd also like to do is say that, look, my left eye is a prosthesis. It's a plastic fantastic. I've had that since the age of uh, five. And in my right eye, well, I'm classified as legally blind. I do have to acknowledge um, the team with, from Save Sight because it was uh, John who did some work there um, and have made my, got rid of my cataract. So yeah, I live and breathe it every day. I'm lucky enough that I get to use it as part of my work and my work gets to take me around the world. What I want to talk about is disruptors first off. Disruptors in technology and disruptors in legislation and how it's changing things that we're doing. So let's have a look. But first off, what I want to think about is dignity. How do we give everybody dignity? Now, the Australian Network for Disability has done some work with the Design for Dignity Retail Guidelines. They're brilliant. And it's something that we try to bring in everywhere. So the first one we're looking at here is independent access. How, it doesn't assume that assistance is required. On the screen on the right-hand side is um, an icon which shows a person in the centre and on the top left is services or interactions, on the right is the technology and the, on the bottom is the building. And it's the interaction of those three things that provide us with good dignity. So can we have independent access everywhere we go? Do we have equitable access? Does it take us longer? Because it damn well shouldn't. Is participation and growth, and particularly in education, is it expected for all students? Or in retail or anything else, is participation something that we expect for all? And is there good customer satisfaction? So do we feel engaged? Do we feel at ease? Do we feel safe and connected? Whether it's in schools, whether it's in retail, whether, wherever it is. That's the four criteria that we're talking about that, design, that is defining dignity and it's something that we should all have. Part of that is also, because I've been doing some work on employment strategies for people with disabilities, we've got to also accept that our outdated definitions of disability. We had the 1980s definition where we talked about, it was very much a medical model. Nowadays we talk about the social model of disability. And so yes, I have a visual impairment that sometimes, as it says, in interaction with different barriers, hinders my participation on the same basis. So what we talk about now is disability is designed. I have a, a visual impairment, but disability is designed. If I've got content that is accessible and made properly, if the buildings are right, I can participate on the same basis. So do I have a disability if I can participate on the same basis? No. But if poor design decisions are made, those design decisions disable me. It's everybody's responsibility, whether it's at work or at school or whatever, to identify barriers to participation and remove those barriers to participation. So that's the UN definition of, and the World Health Organization definition. It's also what's in our New South Wales Disability Inclusion Act. And for those of you who are connected with Department, uh, the Public Service Association or any New South Wales government, we're talking about improving the, the rates of employment for people with disabilities in gov state government from a, a low 2.8 up to 5.6 over the next couple of years. It still, in my personal opinion, needs to be a hell of a lot higher. But it's something we need to do. But it's the interaction of the technology, the services and the buildings that make a difference. But a couple of things before I get on to straight onto the technology. We've got to remember that 205 was the Disability Standards Act. For everybody here who has students at school, we are our own advocates. Recognise that it's about the key line being it's participation on the same basis. So what every child, every, when we say one in five have a disability, we say every classroom has kids with disabilities. Be prepared. It's not, oh, I've got a child with a disability. No, sorry, every class does. So how are you proactively responding for that? Also, we talk about in 2008, we had the World Wide Web Consortium come up with version two of the 
uh, World Wide Web, uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Now we kind of call them the guidelines. They're our digital building code that we can apply to not only websites, but Word documents and PDFs and apps and everything else. But the real issue, and this is from the Human Rights Commission, it's equal access to information and services. If you follow the building code, the digital building code, you can provide equal access. It's been in place since 2008. Yes, a whole heap of people have got to get their act together and make sure that they do provide equal access for all of us. The NDIS has been a disruptor in more ways than one. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yeah. that little bit bitter and ironic comment, uh, la laughter there. But one of the things that it's done is that what were once charities became social enterprises and are now businesses. And that's one of the things that we have to get our head around is that some of the people that we're getting advice from, they are now in a business model. And they're actually touting for your business. And that's the most important thing. You are a customer. If you're not getting the service you want, find another service provider. It's not easy said and done, but remember about your role, your responsibility, but how some people are changing and about how the competition in the market, I look what's happening between Guide Dogs, Visibility, Royal Society for the Blind and Vision Australia, or, and RIDBC, all vying for different parts of the market. The market being you guys, being us. The other thing that's happened is 216, the Marrakesh Treaty. For some of you who are old enough, it's not the song. Now, the Marrakesh Express, but it's about copyright exemptions because we realised that publishers weren't doing the right thing by people with a print disability. And remember, print disability is not just blindness, low vision, it takes in dyslexia, it takes in physical disability. Any, anybody who has is challenged by print and it creates a barrier. But basically what that meant was that if you had a document which wasn't accessible and you, you had purchased a copy, you can actually format shift it and change it and make it accessible. You have those copyright exemptions. It scares the gee willikers out of the publishers, but that's a good thing because they've got the web content accessibility well, guidelines to make sure their content is accessible. And yesterday, Sonali, is Sonali in here? I can't tell, from RIDBC. We have the Australian Inclusive Publishing Initiative. Our goal is that by 2022, every digital textbook in Australia will be 100% uh, accessible and will be EPUBs. But it has a whole industry response. Finally, this is a new E. In America, they had a piece of legislation called Section 508, which was about procurement. And the willing to work um, strategy, which the Human Rights Commission brought out, we said, procurement is a barrier for employment. So now what we do is Australia, uh, what happened was Europeans went, oh, we like Section 508, it's not bad, but we could improve it. They did. Then a couple of years ago, we went, hmm, we like what the Europeans done. In fact, we won't improve it, we'll just copy it. And so the Australian standard, AS, right, Australian standard, that's the only difference between us and the European standard. And it actually, it has the same number. And it says on page two, this is an exact copy. But basically it means when any state or federal government is procuring any form of technology, so computers, phones, websites, apps, digital books, the whole lot, they must take accessibility into consideration. So yes, it affects school libraries if they're buying a digital book or public libraries. They should be taking um, accessibility in as part of their procurement. So that's disrupting how we buy. It's actually a really positive disruptor. But what I want to now look at is some technology. Yes, we remember in 2008, we had the um, App Store and now we've got some great things with uh, digital health and the fact that my, uh, on the screen there is my set of scales, which can then, of course, just read them up on my phone and work with voiceover. We can now collect data and health data. It's not like the uh, my health record, which was, in concept, was good. 
in application, though, leaves a lot to be desired. I think the Canadian example's a lot better. You actually get notified when somebody's accessing your data. We don't. So I'd like to know if there was a nurse in um, Geraldton in Western Australia actually accessing my data. I'd like to know why she would want them. But what it does bring up is the discussion about privacy and security for us. You would have seen some discussions on the news of late where people are saying, is my phone tracking me? Now, um, interestingly, if any of you have an Android phone, be very, very careful. Because what you'll find is that your phone is always constantly listening. And so things that you're do uh, in your conversation will start to appear in your search records. And you go, hang on, but I've never searched for that before. It's their intelligent assistance going, I don't want that level of assistance. And it's something that's there. But some of the disruptors for us. OK, Microsoft. Remember the old days we used to have to buy a, a flatbed scanning device and we'd have to scan documents to convert that printed text? My beloved iPhone is my scanner. And it doesn't matter. Yes, the Kurzweil app, which is out there, which is serious dollars, though, 300 bucks. Microsoft do it with Link, um, which is free. Or I can do it on through Apple Notes. I can just go hit the plus button on Apple Notes and I can scan in a document. So it means that we've got ready access to that content as required. The other big change is AI. And I've got to take a hats off to the Human Rights Commission because they've been doing a lot of work with AI. They've got a really good discussion paper out there at the moment. There's the dark side of AI. So you might have seen the bits about China now with facial recognition and social credit scores, where they'll go, ah, oh, geez, that bloke Matt over there, you know? Hang on. He was jaywalking. He loses social credit points. He was littering. He loses social credit points. Then I was silly enough to hang around with him I will lose social credit points because I was seen with him. Now, it impacts your capacity to get work and to travel. The positive signs, though, of, of AI are some great work Microsoft's been doing, which they designed for Apple first through their garages programs. You might have heard of some of them called Seeing AI, Hearing AI, and Soundscape. So with Seeing AI, yes, I can, it'll describe a scene, I can recognise friends, and I can scan barcodes and I can scan everything. You have also those glasses that people can wear, which will read things. It's basically utilising that same technology. But what we've got to do is remember, AI is only as smart as the information that we put in it. And we have to train it. So yes, that's a barcode, yes, that's a face, or yes, that's the face of my friend, or that's text, and it's part of the business, the model, as we call it in AI, teaching it what those different things are. So it can discriminate and it can make decisions. The other one which I'm going to show in a little bit is Siri Shortcuts. If you've got an iPhone, Siri Shortcuts came out with the iOS 12, and it's great because you can actually chain together a whole range of events. A friend of mine in Tasmania now has one set up when he says good night, what it will do is it will dial his girlfriend. He'll have a FaceTime conversation with her. Once the conversation, because they're in Launceston and Hobart, it's so far away, it's three hours. Um, <laughs> then once the phone call is finished, the FaceTime call is finished, it automatically brings up Netflix for him. So he can then go, all right, I'm here on my own, I'm going to watch something. So, but he set up multi, he can do all sorts of amazing things with it, but it just becomes one voice um, command for it, which makes life easier once you've started to make them, and they work with voiceover. But let's have a little look at a couple of other bits and pieces that have come up. So one of the innovators that's come up is Microsoft Word. Now, you go, OK, Greg, well, Microsoft Word's been around for years. What are you talking about? <coughs> so if I go into view mode in Word now, I 
I can turn on learning tools. And what learning tools does, it's, it knows that a Word document, like a web page, there's the structure of the document, but then there is also the look and feel of the document. And we can separate the two. So now I can come into, uh, into here and I can start to play with these different pieces. So I could now start to play automatically with the page colour if I wanted to. I can start to have it... Australian Inclusive Publishing Initiative. An introduction to inclusive publishing. Introduction. Designing for inclusion. Understanding the legal now, obligations of access. It's got a couple of bugs, but it's there. <laughs> the other one that's in there now, and there's similar tools that these guys have done, is in Microsoft OneNote. So you'll start to see similar technology. So there's the page. I can now click on view. I can now go change the page width. I can change page color depending on what my needs were. I can then look at the paper style. I can then click on the immersive reader. And in the immersive reader, when I turn that on, again, I can separate, I can adjust the font size. On the, f uh, on the fly, have different coloured themes that I'm working depending on what my eyes require. I can also turn on line focus so I can get it to read one line at a time or two. It's still a Word document, but I'm looking at it differently. Surf's really up. Largest wave ever recorded in Southern Ocean. Peter Hannum, 10 Mac. And so I can start to personalise. So it's a really cool disruptor because when you say to the teachers, you go, OK, guys, your job as teachers is give me content that's properly structured, that has heading ones, proper paragraphs, proper bulleted lists. And the department now runs some good online training for all teachers on that. It's then going that they've got these tools in the classroom that you can use. It doesn't matter whether you're on a PC or a Mac or an iPad or whatever, those tools are there for all of the students. It's knowing that they're there and that we can use them. They're just some of the tools that are out there, just from that Microsoft perspective alone. But it's about, you'll notice I said, runs on a PC, runs on a Mac, runs on my iPhone and my iPad, because we go, guys, we don't... Yes, I don't drive a car, I'm legally allowed to drive a Dodgeham car, but <laughs> it's socially acceptable to smash into people in a Dodgeham car, folks. <laughs> now, come on. Being the grandson, have a great time. Now, but the real issue is this. We don't say, when we say, look, we design a car to a certain safety specifications, you know, the five-star ANCAP rating and all of that business. If it meets those ratings, it drives on the road. In education, we go, Guys, as long as the device allows me to do what I want to do, who cares what brand of device you've got? That's such an old school conversation. Pick the device that has the support and the services that you need. And, to, and we all know that our eyes are so unique. For some people, they'll go, look, I prefer Windows. You know? and, I, and, and dare I say, Narrator, I was talking with the guys at Microsoft last week. They've been doing a lot of work with Narrator. It's playing significant catch up. It's a good disruptor because on the PC side, you go, yeah, I've got NVDA, which is free. Narrator is free. And they've come up leaps and bounds. And so for the people who are making JAWS, you go, be very, very scared. Because why should we spend two and a half thousand dollars on something when I can get it for free? And that's the issue. It's a big disruptor in the market. It doesn't have those disability taxes. Now, if I'm on my Mac or I'm on my iPhone, I'm going to, or iPad, I'm going to be using VoiceOver. Holden or a Ford, personal preferences. They both have strengths and weaknesses. Doesn't matter. It's what works best for you. Now, I'm doing some work in, in government at the moment. I'm sitting there next to somebody. They're on their Windows device. I'm on my iPad. We're both connecting to the services, doing all the work we want to do. It's about workplace adjustments or reasonable adjustments. Their IT guys only like to push out PCs, but then they say, oh, yes, yeah, you are entitled to a Mac if you want one or an iPad if you want one. You've just got to ask. But it doesn't matter. Whatever floats your boat, whatever you want to drive, 
pick the one that you want to drive. But the biggest changes are going to come with the growth in AI. And where you saw what was happening now on the screen with um, what I can now do in Microsoft Word and OneNote, they used to be a specialist application. It's the same, dare I say it, with the dreaded NDIS, the conversations that we're having where you go, no, I don't want $10,000 worth of bespoke devices. Just let me have the one device. It's called an iPhone. It fits in my pocket. It's socially valued. It's socially inclusive. And it's a hell of a lot cheaper. And that's a conversation which we've had with the Human Rights Commission and which we know that they're taking back to NDIS, as we know a range of other people have. NDIS, parts of NDIS, are our barrier. And that needs to change. Yes, it's been a disruptor, but it, needs, it itself now needs disrupting. Technology has that part to play. Technology is going to continue to change. The biggest growth you've seen there, all these devices, whether it's a Google, whether it's a, a, my Apple system, whether it's the PC system, have a whole range of accessibility features. The only system, though, that really understands good data security is Apple. Windows do it quite well as well. But as Apple will say to you, and it's something that's really important to us, your data is your data. It's about privacy. So whether it's my health data, because the iPhone, uh, sorry, the, the Watch 4, I've only got a 3, it's now got an ECG monitor in it. It's about to be approved in Australia. It's been approved in the US. So at the moment, an old 3 model, yes, will do heart rate, but when you touch the crown on your, iPhone, on your watch, on the version 4, it's actually an ECG monitor as well. So it's then capturing that data in real time, which you can then share with your health professional. I didn't have to put any other leads. I didn't have to go anywhere else. I can then just, but the beauty of that is I'm constantly collecting good data. I then, because I own it and it works with my thumbprint or my voice print or my face print, have control over who I share it with and where I share it. And that's really important because we've all heard of data breaches everywhere. Now, we don't want our data being breached. It's the same with, with Amazon. I mean, Amazon's great. But when it goes, oh, yeah, last time you ordered a pizza, Greg, you had this, this, and this. And, oh, do you want this with it as well? And I go, because Amazon's actually been called into court. Um, Alexa has been called into court because Alexa's always listening. Yep. Now, it recorded a murder. So the question is, they then got, it's an interesting one to read, because you then go, oh, but they said, oh, it's the violation of their right to privacy. So they, they actively fought the release of that data. But they're always listening. And that's, that's the thing, because both Amazon and both Google, their, their business model is based on data, S selling, analysing and connecting data and selling data. So if you're going to use those devices, not a problem. We saw Alexa being used um, willy-nilly because it was advertising on, on the block. I personally would prefer to do it with HomeKit on my uh, iOS devices because I can do all the same things. It's just that it has to use my voice model or my fingerprint or my face for that extra security. The other thing you can do with it, and that's something to think about, is if with an ageing population or with, if you've got carers, is going... I don't have to give them a key. I can give Matt, say, Matt's uh, going to be one of my support people. I'm going to give him his Apple ID so when he comes up to the door, he can say, hey, that lady's name, um, open the door, and it will let him in. But if we've decided that we're going to do something else now and I don't need Matt's services, I can revoke his privileges. I think Renee does the same, doesn't she, mate? <laughs> um, but... It's one of those things. You're not, I'm not having to share a key or any of those other bits and pieces. But it's how we start to use that AI. AI is great, but with AI comes it's the rights and the responsibilities, and it's with our data security. And thinking about what are we prepared to have on there. That's the other really, really crucial thing. So my take-homes, guys, look at the legislation. Learn how you can use the legislation to advocate for your rights because it's th that's why it's there in the first place. 
the technology were just in general life, but in education and through work, are some of those things that are going to enable you to participate on the same basis. They're going to continue to get smarter, quicker, easier and cheaper. But the one in the room is watching what we do with that data privacy and security, because as everything is always there in our pocket and we're collecting all this stuff, how do we make sure that we have control over that? The nice thing, like with Siri shortcuts and everything else, I know by default it works with voiceover. And that's the thing I like too. It works consistently. I don't want to have to bother tinkering with it. I just want it to damn well work. And that's the thing. But thanks, Matt. I'll look at some Q&A. We've got time still. There was a couple of questions. Yeah, look, thank you very much, Greg, for running through that. Um, that's great. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's so encouraging because I remember when I was a, a, a very small lad um, having to travel for work, um, getting lost was not a theoretical possibility but an actual regular occurrence and the nature of my work took me overseas and, and um, from the start of my career uh, getting lost and uh, getting mugged in a very polite way uh, at the start but now uh, in recent years having a phone anywhere in the world with with all the all all the accessibility and all the help, it's just it's it's really transformed things, and you know it's it's, it's great. So look, I'm going to throw it open to questions now. You're going to have to sort of three, Matty, beforehand. Big button. Oh, you three had three. You, you, you had three. You, I do. I do. Do you have them handy? Yeah, I do. Have awesome. One. Beautiful. Go for it. We'll go for those three first. Yeah, the right. first Excellent. question that I was given uh, was about uh, games uh, for for children and or just games in general. My go-to place is Apple Viz because I can then go to there and then on the screen I can then search. They've got 430 name, 439 games that have been reviewed by the uh, uh, community. So these are people with blindness and low vision themselves. And so go and have a look at their user reviews and then you can find games that uh, will best suit you. Uh, another question was to do with um, what device should I have for school? I kind of answered part of that already. It's really about what your needs are. Now, any of those devices are fine. For me, I spend most of my time, I do have a PC. Uh, the department provided me with one. It's uh, kind of just sitting there at the moment. I'm about to hand it back. Um, the reason being that um, I've found that the way that it displays text on screen is not as sharp for me as what it is on my Mac or my iPad. And that's, and I go, but that's for me. I know for other people, they will choose something else. But all of them have those inbuilt screen readers now, and it's a matter of you becoming familiar. But if anybody says, oh, our school must have this, nah. If you think your child needs something particular because of their needs, the department has both PC and Macs on their services. Any school should. And really, if they are stopping you from getting that, that's when we come back to the disability standards for education, and we go, that's getting in the way of my child's education. You're making, because it's easier for your IT team because they haven't learned how to support that device, don't put their limitation as a limitation on my child. Know the legislation because that's where the power is. Screen readers, yep, there's a whole stack of them around. As I said, um, look at the, the freebies, um, they're really good. For those of you who are, um, I, in, I noticed there's a couple here who are itinerant teachers support vision from the department. I would actively encourage you to look at both what narrator's doing, but also I know a lot of you know voiceover, but um, my personal opinion is bespoke expensive products like JAWS are on their way out. Because as we start to see more and more things which both Microsoft and Apple, I mean Google has TalkBack, it's not, it's not too bad, but when I look at what, between the Raider and um, VoiceOver that are part of the operating system, and guys just to be a little bit techy, because it's part of the operating system, it means when they update the operating system they update the screen reader automatically, so you're not having to pay for updates. It also means because it's part of the operating system that it's more stable because it's, it's embedded. It's not an add-on over the top. It's not like putting an extension on a house and then putting another extension on. It's, it's part of there. 
Uh, other questions, Matty? If we've got people. Um, yeah, so if we've got any questions to the audience, yell out so I can find you. Yep. Oh, hang on a second, wait a second, because we're recording this, so I'm going to bring a microphone over. Sorry. So when you're going to the supermarket and you want to look at, at items in the supermarket, what would be the best thing to have so that you know that you're buying the right product? I use my iPhone. I do it for a couple of things because it doesn't matter whether I'm using the inbuilt magnifier um, or I then need to have it screen read to me. I can use them. I can use those inbuilt features. I carry it with me all the time. I do have to say that my other uh, most important assistive feature is called the torch. Um, <laughs> now, particularly when you travel a lot and you go into a motel room and you go. Yes, the lights are really good if I was bringing my wife away with me and it'd be nice and soft and romantic, but when you want good contrast and you try to set the air conditioning system, getting that extra light and the contrast, yeah, I love my torch. Oh, and finally, of course, remember, of course, that you've got um, Apple Pay, um, which, of course, I now have all my credit cards on my phone securely in here. So I, of course, can do my payments by my phone or by my watch. And, of course, when I do do that payment, it's either using my facial recognition or my fingerprint recognition. And because it works with VoiceOver, it will also then read that transaction out to me. So when you start to say, how can I safely, securely and independently do a tap-and-go transaction, that's the way I do it at shopping. I can even use my Woolies card to earn my loyalty points and make sure that VoiceOver will read it out for me too. Yes, are Woolies tracking me? Yeah. Do I mind on that one? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, have we got any other questions in the audience? Oh, sorry. Oh, come on over. Sorry. Thank you. Hi, Greg. Hi. Um, do you know much about driverless cars? And my son who's blind, will he be able to drive in the future? Yes, he will. Now, there's the whole question of legislation that's going to happen around this one because at, at some point what you've got to say is in an interim level, if it needs to go back to manual rather than automatic, does the person have certain capacities or not? The other thing that's happening though which is really interesting is the AI decisions like that's happening in, uh, with Mercedes and BMW at the moment about crash detection and about will it determine, it goes, oh, well, look, the, the AI rule is you will, if, the, if you're going to have to hit somebody, you want to cause the least amount of damage to people. So that's its kind of decision rule. And so what are our decision rules when if we're coming, and we, oh, my God, we're going to crash. I don't want to hit the cat. Do I hit the little, you know, the little kid? Do I hit the pensioner? Do I hit the, you know, you know, who am I going to hit? And you're making all these decisions while trying to swerve. The, the AI and the car is going to go, what's the likelihood of us causing the least amount of damage? And it doesn't put a value on any one person. So that will be part of that as well. But yes, um, look, we've got driverless cars working now. I mean, they've done tests throughout Europe. They've done tests here in Australia. Volvo and everybody have got them all out. Um, we've got driverless buses. It's really about... Um, improving some of that. So I would say within the next five years, we'll start to see that being um, mainstreamed because we've got it now. It's just a matter of time. It's then a matter of the legislation going, what will we or won't we allow? If I could, if I could expand on that, um, I, I know that um, Waymo, which is held by the same company that holds Google, is running, um, has run for the last six months fully autonomous driverless vehicles in Georgia. Yep. as a taxi service. So um, there's enormous economic pressure on this technology. Um, the, the barriers are um, legislative and, and enough statistical information to prove it's safe. And so it's, it's not if but when, I think. Yeah, very, mu very much so. So here's the question. Will you get picked up for drink driving? <laughs> and does the rules about using your mobile phone whilst technically driving the car change as well? Any other questions? So uh, over here. So, yep. <laughs> How are you going? <laughs> I get knocked down. 
<laughs> if I could, uh, sorry, over here somewhere, right? Uh, just pass the microphone down. Greg, where, where are you at with NDIS with regards to um, iPads and those sort of things? Look, some iPads are getting through, others aren't. It depends upon how they're getting written up. That's a conversation, yeah, so if somebody says, oh, no, they're not, they're telling porkies, okay? Um, there is an art to how it gets written up. But again, that's the conversation because you're going, oh, yes, we will buy you the app but we won't buy you the device. And I'm going, okay. Um, I know both Apple and a whole range of the tech companies have already gone into NDIS. As I said, human rights are. Um, but I would actively suggest that you contact your local member and talk about those problems and how there are some easy solutions. Because the more that they see that there's votes, the more that they will change it. You have that power. Use it. Which, which gives me the perfect opportunity to plug the NDIS discussion panel this afternoon, where we hope to hope to cover some of these issues, T tips and tricks to exchange on on getting navigating the NDIS. Do we have a final question? Sorry, at the back, Mike. Here you go. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Um, just a question in terms of you mentioned more accessible materials in school now. I think more yep. electronic format. And I'm interested in how you're seeing that progressing and also how technology is going in terms of like whole screen braille readers. Well, I mean, this on the braille readers, I mean, uh, Microsoft and, and Apple have worked quite collaboratively on the new uh, braille standards uh, for the Bluetooth devices, which is really good. Um, in the end, it comes down to uh, most people have learnt to um, a self-taught with Microsoft Word or other products like that. So I want, for those of you who are drive, I want you to imagine what it's like if you all self-taught yourself to drive, what it would be like. It's a bit of a scary thought. And so what's happened is most people, when they've used Microsoft Word, have gone, oh, look, to make a heading, just highlight it. You know, you can make it bigger. But we didn't add heading ones, heading twos. doesn't add the structure to it that little button bar, because we know when they use that, it puts a little piece of code behind the document. So one of the things that we've been doing is working with the Learning and Wellbeing Unit to say, um, guys, when teachers actually create properly structured documents, it's actually an example of them of their professional teaching standards. Good teaching is inclusive teaching. There are the, the department has now got a whole range of online courses and also access to all the lynda.com um, uh, professional trainings, every teacher's got that. Is everybody doing it? No, it's a work in progress. But in the end, they go, Microsoft Word and PowerPoint and Excel will go check accessibility. It's got inbuilt check accessibility features. And that's one of the things we go, guys, you spell check, you grammar check, and before you get, give it to any child, you accessibility check the document. It's not hard. It actually tells you what you've done wrong and how to fix it. One of the other things that we've done within the department is, for instance, I and some colleagues have set up a new set of master templates that are accessible for the department. So they can start to roll those out. We go, let's create once, roll those out. Our next goal on that is that every departmental computer will actually have them pre-installed rather than having to download them. That's our, our next part. And so if you follow our paragraph styles and you use those, there's no reason why. So we've got the training, we've got the templates, we've got everything else there. You've got the tools. It's now about building that awareness of some staff. One of the things that I do do with principals is I show them that if you get good paragraph styles and you get good line spacing, for those of you who have been to university, you'll go, oh, yeah, I had to, double, I had to do this thing called um, double line spacing. What was reason for? It was so that the professors could all read through the document quickly. What is the web accessibility standard now for line spacing? 1.5 line spacing. Because it's about being able to read, everybody reading efficiently. If there's enough white space between the start of, end of one line and the start of the other, we can actually read more efficiently. So there's some of the changes. But yeah, teachers are doing it. They've just got to be, get more awareness of it. And so we're, it's a long campaign, but we'll get there. They've got the tools, they've got everything else there. 
Thank, thank you very much, Greg. I really appreciate it.